Sure. Yeah. Okay, dear guests, partners, and donors, friends, my name is Abakon Sultan Nazarov, uh, IWPR Regional Director in Central Asia. I am delighted to see all of you here with us at our international expert meeting titled Central Asia's Geopolitical Importance, Western Policies and Agendas. Let me welcome all of you here on behalf of the Institute for War and Peace Reporting, IWPR in Central Asia. IWPR Central Asia has been a trusted partner for policymakers, academics, and civil society actors in the region, providing accurate, balanced, and advised reporting and analytics on Central Asia's political, social, and economic developments. Furthermore, IWPR Central Asia and its central in its regional platform, Kabar Asia, have been instrumental in promoting dialogue and understanding between different stakeholders in the region, facilitating roundtables, workshops, and other events that bring together policymakers, civil society actors, and experts to discuss key issues facing the region. Thank you all for joining us today to discuss such an important issue. As we gather here today, we are facing unprecedented challenges in the war. The war in Ukraine has brought new geopolitical realities for the forefront. It is therefore essential to re-examine the European Union and United States strategies for Central Asia to ensure they adequately address current realities. The discussion today are of utmost importance as we are living in a world that is changing rapidly. It is imperative that we work together to develop new approaches that address the needs of the region and promote stability and prosperity. Today, we have an amazing panel of experts who will reflect on the current changes and Western relations with Central Asia region. I'm delighted and honored to see such prominent experts here today with us. Last but not least, this online expert meeting, expert meeting is part of a series under the Amplify, Verify, Engage, Information for Democratization and Good Governance in Eurasia's project generously funded by the Royal Norwegian Government. We sincerely thank the Norwegian Government for being a long-term donor and partner. We are very honored and proud to be holding this event tonight and look forward to having more events with our esteemed partner in the future. I'm confident that the discussion today will be insightful, thought-provoking and productive. I urge you all to engage in lively debate to challenge each other's ideas and to work together to find solutions. Thank you for your attention. And on this note, I'm passing the floor to our amazing moderator for today, Dr. Nargis Kasenova, Director, Program on Central Asia, Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies, Harvard University. Dr. Kasenova, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Sultan Azarov. Um, Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I guess we're tuning in from at least three continents um, today. Uh, it is my pleasure and honor to uh, moderate today's, uh, today's session um, titled Central Asia's Geopolitical Importance, Western Policies and Agendas. And we have uh, an amazing panel for you today. Uh, but first, let me uh, let me share some housekeeping uh, some housekeeping regulations with you, housekeeping rules. Um, first, uh, we are providing a simultaneous interpretation during this event. Uh, so um, now I'll read the message for Russian speaking audience. My speech will be synchronous перевод во время мероприятия, поэтому если хотите переключиться на русский язык, выберите русский язык на нижней панели в Zoom со знаком Globus. А если у вас возникли проблемы, пожалуйста, напишите нашим представителям, которые вы найдете в чате с припиской IWPR. Um, uh, this event is on record and uh, will be taking occasional snapshots. So in case you are not comfortable with that, kindly inform us by writing to our colleagues in the chat box. Um, once again, um, people who have an IWPR in their names. However, we would appreciate if you stay with your cameras on uh, so that we have a sense of being together, particularly for the Q and A session, I think that will be uh, that will be relevant. 
Uh, please drop your questions in the chat box during the event and um, and when it's time for the Q&A uh, session, we'll address them. Um, last but not least, we understand the complexity of the topic and that uh, people might have some strong feelings, but we urge each and everyone in the audience to remain civil when asking questions during the Q&A and abide um, gender and conflict sensitivity. So with that, uh, let me um, let me go to the panel itself and uh, introduce um, introduce our speakers in the order they will be giving uh, giving their remarks. Uh, we'll start with Ambassador George Kroll, uh, who is an adjunct professor at the U.S. Naval War College. Uh, he is former U.S. ambassador to Kazakhstan, to Uzbekistan. Uh, former Deputy Assistant Secretary for Central Asian Affairs, uh, and uh, he held many, many other positions that uh, uh, that made him engage with, uh, with our region. Um, and I'm happy to say that uh, Ambassador Kroll is also an associate at the, uh, at the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies, my home institution. Uh, then we'll go to Dr. Brian Todd, who is an adjunct assistant professor at the Center for uh, Security Studies. Um, then we will go to Dr. Karolina Kluczewska, a postdoctoral researcher at the Ghent Institute for International and European, European Studies. Um, next would be Dr. Zhenebek Arinev, um, assistant professor at the Graduate School of Public Policy at Nazarbayev University. And last but not least, we'll go to Dr. Fabian Bosud, associate professor at Ghent University. I'm sure these are all familiar names to you. So, um, so without further ado, uh, let's go to Ambassador Kroll. Ambassador Kroll, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, Assalamu alaikum, and uh, thank you very much for um, uh, inviting me to uh, speak with you all. Uh, I guess when we were uh, working on setting up this uh, uh, this seminar. Uh, I didn't know that Secretary of State uh, Anthony Blinken was going to be visiting uh, Central Asia. So his visit last week, I think, encapsulates uh, a lot of what I'm looking at, which is in assessing uh, the United States policy agenda in Central Asia right at this time, and particularly amidst the, the war in Ukraine. Uh, it, um, so it, it allows us to wonder, like, what is new about U.S. policy and how has the Ukrainian conflict changed it? as well as the timing of this visit, I think it's, it, it was, it's very important as well. This is the highest level visit of a Biden administration of figure since the administration came into office. Uh, and it's uh, also the first uh, high level visit since uh, the February 24th um, invasion of Ukraine, but also it's the highest level visit since the United States withdrew from Afghanistan, which was another major seismic shift uh, in American policy towards Central Asia. Uh, so I think both of these events, that is the invasion of Ukraine, the American withdrawal in Af from Afghanistan have affected US policy in the region. And certainly in the case of Afghanistan, its presence in the region. I believe in all likelihood, uh, the Ukraine war played a decisive role encouraging Secretary of State Blinken to make this visit to Central Asia on his way to the G20 uh, meeting of ministers in India. Uh, I think it was to show uh, in visiting Kazakhstan, holding the C5 plus one meeting and then going on to Uzbekistan before arriving in India is to demonstrate to the countries in the region, but also to their big neighbors, i.e. Russia and China, that the United States has not abandoned Central Asia since Afghanistan, and I think has focused more attention on it uh, as a result of the war in Ukraine. So the region may not be critical to US uh, security and economic interests, uh, but it remains and has probably grown in importance in the overall U.S. policy of trying to show support to countries, even if it's only symbolic, against uh, Russian and Chinese dominance. Uh, in contrast, I find it interesting that after the withdrawal from Afghanistan, there was no high-level visit from the United States. In fact, it seemed that our 
relations, American relations were sort of frozen in time. Maybe it was to avoid embarrassment, but it probably would have been prudent to shore up US credibility in the region had uh, someone gone out there to explain what was going on with US policy towards the region, because after all, Afghanistan had been so important uh, to American uh, policy rhetoric, certainly in Central Asia, um, by saying that we were going to stand with Afghanistan uh, for as long as it takes. And we've heard this mentioned with Ukraine as well, but that wasn't the case. Um, and I think that had an effect on perhaps perceptions of the United States and its policy and its commitment to the region, um, particularly in the states in Central Asia. <clears throat> I would also say that this visit, the fact that uh, Secretary Blinken went to Kazakhstan. Now there was the C5 plus meeting, which was probably arranged at that time in order to ensure Blinken could attend on his way to the bigger event, I think, and on his agenda, which was the C20, I mean, the, uh, the, uh, the G20 meeting in India. But his visit to Kazakhstan also, I think, reflects a, a rather warming of relations between the United States and Kazakhstan, which had, I think, uh, been chilled as a result of the January 2022, 20, uh, a year ago, more than a year ago, uh, events that took place there, where the initial American reaction there was when the CSTO troops came in, particularly the Russian troops, I believe I remember Secretary Blinken sort of questioning why Kazakhstan was doing this, uh, as well as the arrest uh, and, and imprisonment of a uh, the uh, Mr. Masimov, the head of the security service, who was viewed, I think, in the United States and elsewhere as being a, a pro-Western figure. And then there was the, the order of shoot to kill. These sorts of things had put a chill in the relationship between the United States and, and Kazakhstan. Uh, there were no high-level calls of, of support for President Takayev and his government at the time. And there were even calls in Congress for uh, sanctions uh, against Kazakhstan. But the Ukraine war just a, a month later changed that dynamic and the United States changed its approach it's to Kazakhstan. And, and while it's looking closely, very closely at Kazakhstan's relationship with Russia, uh, it has pulled back on its rhetoric and the fact that, that Blinken uh, visited uh, Kazakhstan and that and that the C5 plus one meeting was held in Astana, I think is a sign that that relationship is, um, is, is warming up. Uh, also, Astana has taken steps to uh, position itself in, better, in a better position with the United States and probably with, um, with the European Union on the UN votes where Kazakhstan hasn't exactly condemned uh, Russia. The, President Takayev's public refusal to re recognize the Russian annexations, and then most recently sending these, uh, what I would call comfort yurts to, um, to Ukraine and to, to the town of, of Busha. I think also the fact that um, Secretary Blinken uh, visited Uzbekistan after uh, his visit in, uh, in Kazakhstan in the C5 plus meeting is another reflection that that of, of a change in American policy that even preceded the Biden administration, which was focusing more on Uzbekistan as a key partner, if not perhaps the key partner in the future for the United States in Central Asia. Uh, I think this follow on visit to, to Tashkent shows that continued support and, and emphasis on Uzbekistan. There was, although the secretary met with the foreign ministers and the other uh, for, um, the other three uh, Central Asian uh, republics of the C5 plus one, um, there was really, there was no commitment that he would visit those countries or engage them. And the comments that he made before meeting them were rather pro forma about, again, expressing support for the sovereignty, territorial integrity and, uh, and independence of these countries. Now, taking that, the visit and what was said there, it encapsulated uh, certainly rhetorically a lot of the contours of American policy uh, in Central Asia today. <clears throat> and the fact that I would say that the rhetoric remains pretty much the same as it has since 1991, but it's changed its emphasis, I think, resulting from the war in Ukraine, the withdrawal from Afghanistan. And also I would add heightened US concerns about China, uh, which is something that is 
increasingly part of the American policy of, uh, look at Central Asia, as well as much of the rest of the world. Uh, Blinken repeated at every stop, and, and, and particularly his message was US support for independent sovereignty and territorial integrity. But with the reference now is to the potential threat from Russia after the invasion of Ukraine. And then he also added the warnings about becoming too reliant on China. So this is a somewhat of a, of a shift, uh, but still that's that same mantra of support for independent sovereignty and territorial integrity. Uh, also after the Ukrainian invasion, the US is now stressing more publicly this defense of the rules-based world order in the region. And Blinken mentioned this. And I think that is a reflection too of the, the policy of both towards Russia as well as China and that wanting the Central Asian countries to respect the world, the, the rules-based order. That was not some of the, that was not in the rhetoric uh, in years gone by. Now, there's also very little mention that Lincoln made of Afghanistan, which had previously been a centerpiece of US policy in the region. Uh, the US has no security presence in uh, the Central Asian countries and probably has no intention of coming back. Uh, to, to, to the region in that way. There was also no mention of war on terror or countering Islamic extremism. These were other aspects of American policy and on the agenda uh, in, in, in Central Asia, but that seems to have disappeared for the most part, certainly rhetorically. Uh, and there was also muted mention of hydrocarbons and also even the talk of transit routes you know, there's no mention of New Silk Road or the Middle Corridor per se. Instead, the, uh, the, the, the American sort of initiative, or at least how they deal with this issue, is still regional inter, uh, interconnectivity and interregional trade na named under this initiative, the Economic Resilience in Central Asian Initiative, which is really cast as a means, again, of avoiding reliance on China and on Russia. And the secretary announced some rather modest funding, uh, an additional 25 million, but there was a little detail as to where actually all of this money is going to be going to. It was probably something that was cobbled together as a what they call a deliverable on these visits, which is symbolic and important in that respect, but we'll see how impactful it will be on the matter of promoting regional interconnectivity there was also no mention of climate change in Central Asia, and I would say that that is a growing threat to the region's economies, the welfare and security of them, but there, that was not, it seems, part of the agenda. Maybe they discussed it uh, in the C5 plus one, but I, 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 I didn't see any reference to it in the public um, comments about it. There was also less emphasis on promoting democracy and human rights. I mean, there was a, a, a clear expression of support for the reform plans of Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan leadership, but one could see there was no desire to estrange these governments on the democracy agenda for fear, I believe, of pushing them closer to Russia and China. And the US is now pushing, putting big efforts, uh, uh, efforts into English language training, more so than democracy promotion projects uh, and also you didn't hear a lot of talk about civil society, which had been a major component, but one can see how promoting English language is kind of a softer way of promoting civil society and, and the like, but not actually saying those words, a civil society. Uh, also what was prominent is the US um, wanting to avoid inflicting collateral damage on the Central Asian countries as a result of the sanctions against Russia over Ukraine. Uh, there is certainly, he mentioned this several times about being understanding and pragmatic, uh, understanding the uh, difficult position the Central Asian countries are in between Russia and China, but particularly not one realizing they can't cut their ties to it. Now, there was also very little mention of, as I said, hydrocarbons, but still there's no desire to hurt um, the Tengi Chevron oil project in the North Caspian, which is the largest American and remains the largest sort of American flagged uh, investment in the region. And certainly it is Kazakhstan's lifeline for, uh, you know, for, for, for its economy. 
so the um, uh, he again wanted to avoid putting the Central Asian countries in too difficult a spot by also not encouraging them to condemn or isolate Russia or avoiding China. I think it's the recognition perhaps of the American administration of its limitations in Central Asia. Um, and uh, I think the Ukraine war has caused some of this, this kind of hands-off approach to the Central Asians on the matter of their sort of political dynamic in their own countries. He did mention them and spoke about the need to follow through on reforms, but it wasn't sort of the centerpiece. The centerpiece was support for sovereignty, territorial integrity, and, and independence. Uh, I think Blinken was careful not to be so public in attacking China on this visit, although if you read Assistant Secretary Liu's uh, testimony to the House of Representatives, the Foreign Relations Committee uh, earlier um, or, or last year, <clears throat> It, it focused really on count, countering Chinese influence and warning of too much dependency on China. And that was reflected in what Blinken said, but in a somewhat more muted terms than, than the assistant secretary had. And I would say that the United States uh, uh, approach to Central Asia is now really more zero sum than earlier. The United States earlier would say, we're not into a zero sum game in Central Asia. Uh, and that China and Russia could be partners in the development of Central Asia and in Central Asian affairs. But that is not something we're saying anymore because I think the great game is still ongoing and China is now a part of the great game. Um, and uh, the United States, I would say, because of its lack of presence and it's, it's also, it's, it's not putting an awful lot of resources into Central Asia, either diplomatic, economic or, or security. Uh, that it's less of a player, but still wants to be able to have influence in a region, although the influence may be less than it had. So overall, I would say that the U.S. is seeing now Central Asia through its prism of its relationship with Russia and with China, and that the Ukraine war has heightened that U.S. attention to the region, but in the context of those policies toward preventing Russian and Chinese domination uh, in that region, but also more uh, uh, globally. Um, I think that the Central Asian region still is peripheral to the United States, particularly since the United States has left Afghanistan and the security relationship is far less salient. Uh, there still has been no presidential visit or engagement uh, beyond letters sent. Uh, President Biden, even when he was Senator, Vice President, and now president, I don't think he, has any, he never visited before. In fact, Blinken never visited the region when he was involved in the Senate as well as deputy secretary of state. Um, but, and so I think Central Asia has now been given to the State Department to curate. Um, and the Biden administration clearly sees their biggest overall strategic threat in the region as well as in globally is China. And uh, the, the Central Asia policy figures into this, the China policy. So I'd say the US is not walking away from Central Asia, uh, but it's not, a, not that important to the United States as it had been previously when the United States was in Afghanistan. Um, but, and it may be a sign of diminishing US power and influence in the region, uh, but it clearly affects the, the Ukraine war has affected the contours and emphases of US policy in the Central Asia region. Finally, I would say that the United States, this, the Biden administration did issue a national security strategy last year. And the mention of Central Asia it was rather perfunctory. And uh, it again shows that the view of Central Asia is looking at it as a part of other policies towards Russia, towards China, uh, and uh, also, Central Asian affairs in the White House at the National Security uh, Council are in the Russia directive, whereas previously in the Trump administration, it was in the South and Central Asia directive. In the State Department, it remains in South and Central Asia, but this shows that it's again a part of other policies and not really a, a policy in and of itself. Uh, but this we'll see because every administration that I've been in had a strategy towards Central Asia. I haven't seen one yet that the Biden administration is coming out with, maybe they're working on it, but I would suspect that like its predecessors, if there is going to be one, it would be a repackaging 
of older strategies along the contours and emphases that I just tried to, uh, um, um, to, to uh, bring to your attention. Anyways, thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador Kroll. Um, can we go to uh, Dr. Todd to, to continue with the theme of the US engagement in the region? Thank you, Dr. Kasanova. Uh, thank you too to the Central Asian Bureau for Analytical Reporting for holding this event today. I think this is a fantastic opportunity to have a great discussion and I'm delighted to be here alongside this distinguished panel of experts. Uh, I have to say at the beginning, so my full-time job, I am a professor at the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies at the US National Defense University, which means I work for the US Department of Defense. So my disclaimer up front is that the views expressed today are my own personal views and not the views of the Department of Defense or the US government. Um, but I think a lot of what I have to say is going to either be in response to what Ambassador Kroll already stated or elaborating a little further upon some of the points he made about Secretary of State Blinken's most recent visit to, to Central Asia. Uh, I really wanted to frame this in terms of the domestic and regional considerations for U.S. engagement with Central Asia. Uh, looking back over the last decade, there are a few trends that tend to jump out at me as far as our engagement with the region from a U.S. perspective on both the U.S. side, but then also perspectives that I've heard from a lot of our Central Asian partners. There are just certain themes that come up repeatedly. I think, you know, one of the, the themes that has been most recent is that we are suddenly now interested in Central Asia because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, that this attention that Russia is now paying to Ukraine means that we need to become more involved in some of these other countries in the area around Russia. I, I really put no, no credence into that, considering that, you know, we have had very active partnerships with the countries in Central Asia since they declared independence in 1991. Um, Kazakhstan's a great example of that. Kazakhstan borders Russia, but that was one of the, the primary countries that the United States was engaging with in the post-independence period, largely on efforts related to non-proliferation and denuclearization. So certainly there has been a lot of work that has been going on over the last 30 plus years it hasn't just recently started. The, these efforts are, are many years in the making. We've evolved, I think, some of the, the areas of focus, but that doesn't mean that we haven't been interested over time. Um, you know, when you look at the most recent national security strategy, which Ambassador Cole mentioned, it came out October of 2022, it talks about U.S. interests in supporting the sovereignty, independence, territorial integrity of the countries in Central Asia. That, too, has been a very consistent theme over the last several decades, not, not something that we've suddenly decided that we want to start working on with our partners in Central Asia. So I think, again, that has always been a foundation of our relationships with the countries there. When you look at where we go from here, you know, in light of all of the, the geopolitical events of late in the region, I think that there are opportunities, but there are also some challenges. For opportunities, as Ambassador Cole pointed out, you know, we are still working very actively in the C5 plus one format. Uh, we have all of these different initiatives going on in, in working group formats, whether that is a security working group, I know that there's an energy working group, a climate change working group. So there are different areas that countries can focus on with the United States based on the, the topics that are of most interest and most relevant to their particular needs. Um, I know that there's also criticism that we're not giving a, a lot of high value, high level visits to the region. I would disagree with that. Aside from Secretary Blinken's most recent visit, there's been a lot of activity in Central Asia and also Central Asian visits coming to the United States over the past year. Um, this is both on the defense side. We've had deputy ministers of defense from our partners in Central Asia visiting the United States. We've had U.S. officials going to the region at the deputy assistant secretary level. 
uh, assistant secretary level in the case of, of assistant secretary Liu from the State Department. I think where the issue lies is that there's not a lot of press coverage of these visits because they are low visibility. And sometimes that is at the partner's request. So then the real question becomes, what level of engagement publicly do our partners in Central Asia want to have with the United States? How much attention do they want to draw to the fact that they're visiting the United States or they're hosting US officials in the region? I think that's really a question for our partners in the region because certainly they can control that narrative as well. There's a lot of things that we're working on in terms of border security, counterterrorism. Ambassador Kroll mentioned, you know, the U.S. military withdrawal from Afghanistan and how Afghanistan has kind of faded away. I have to say, from just a, a Department of Defense perspective, that's that's really not true at all. We're we're still doing a lot in the security realm. I think, if anything, the challenge is resources at this point, because so much of the funding and personnel that we were able to do things with in Central Asia was tied to Afghanistan. The fact that we no longer have military forces in Afghanistan means that the money and personnel that went along with that have gone away. And now it's finding new forms of support, new forms of funding to be able to support the initiatives that we want to do with our partners in Central Asia. But certainly I don't think that it's a lack of interest or initiative on the part of either the United States or our partners in Central Asia because both sides want to continue working on these security issues together. Another security issue is the repatriation of women and children from Syria. Uh, most recently in February, there were a group of 59 citizens from Kyrgyzstan that we helped repatriate. Uh, congratulations to the government of Kyrgyzstan. That was a huge, huge lift by them. Um, but they're not the only country doing that. Uzbekistan has also repatriated citizens. Kazakhstan did as well with Operation Juzan. We've worked with them to support all of these different operations. So that's certainly something that we want to continue to partner with the countries in Central Asia on and actually want other countries to look to Central Asia as a model on how they too can repatriate their citizens. So certainly lots of work that can be done there. So I've talked a little bit about the challenges or a little bit about the opportunities. Let me speak a little bit about the challenges. Uh, I think it goes to something I pointed out, which is the visibility on a lot of these initiatives. I think that there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes, but then it goes to how much of that is visible to the public for a lot of reasons. Um, and the real question is how much pressure can Central Asia resist from its other partners? If Russia or China are seeing all of the things that Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan are doing with the United States, are these countries then going to face increased pressure to do more with Russia or China as a result of their engagement with the US? I think that's certainly a, a concern for our partners. At the same time, I think they're also concerned that we will go away. You know, we we departed militarily from Afghanistan, and certainly there was a fear that we would abandon the region as a whole following the military withdrawal. I don't think that that has proven to be true, but I think that lack of demonstrated constancy on both sides is kind of what harbors the, the lingering distrust in terms of, you know, is the U.S. in this for a long-term relationship or are we going to leave when we become more interested in something else that's a bigger priority? Similarly, I think there's concerns that, you know, the Central Asians want to partner with us now, but, you know, if they get a better offer from Russia or China, are they going to decide that they don't want to continue some of these initiatives? So certainly there's some communication that needs to happen on both sides. I think an, an additional factor that we don't take into account enough is the role of the US Congress. We speak a lot about the Biden administration's priorities, 
but certainly Congress plays a huge role in U.S. foreign policy in terms of oversight that it can conduct on what we're able to do, as well as appropriating funding for some of the measures that I mentioned previously. So insofar as we have executive branch support, we also need legislative branch support. And I think that is where the U.S. is very different from the other partners that the countries in Central Asia may work with, is we don't necessarily have the strong unified front that they see from other partners, because we have so many voices in the US government trying to figure out you know, what our priorities are, what our policies should be. We're not always speaking in unison and we're not always speaking strongly. And I think that can be very confusing for the other side when they're hearing some of the messages coming from the United States. So certainly, too, that also complicates matters insofar as what we're able to do in terms of things like private investment, economic development. Because the U.S. government cannot direct U.S. businesses to go to Central Asia, to develop their businesses there, to invest in Central Asia, it's very hard for us to put, you know, solid investment in terms of real money into the region in a way that, that other countries can. Um, if we're talking about Russia and China, for instance, we don't have state-owned energy companies that can go in and invest billions of dollars because we just don't have that in the United States. So certainly there's just not an equal playing field in that regard. Um, I think some of the other things that we have to think about is, well, the countries in Central Asia have a variety of options, and there are many partners that they can work with. Certainly, there are implications for partners that they choose to work with. I'm thinking specifically of Russia at this time due to what's going on in Ukraine, sanctions that could result from working with Russia. Again, from very much a defense perspective, if we're talking about things like defense equipment procurement, spare parts for Russian equipment that the countries in Central Asia already own. I think continuing to engage with Russia in the defense sector opens them up to a, a lot of risk at this point. So these are some of the challenges that our partners have to think about as they're working with both the United States and other partners as well. So I'm going to close on that note. Look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. And maybe we can also ref, refer the um, the audience to the hearing that just took place um, on the 8th of March. And um, Assistant Secretary Lu was giving a testimony and also Assistant Secretary for Energy Resources, uh, I think Piat, if I'm pronouncing correctly. Um, so that was a very interesting, uh, very interesting hearing. And, you know, for those who want to understand better the the u.s engagement maybe can check it out um okay let's uh let's go to the uh to our european uh, participants what's the uh what's the eu approach what is happening what is happening there with the eu engagement in central asia and um uh first we'll go to um dr kulchevska uh, thank you very much. So without further ado, because I think we are a little bit uh, running out of time. So uh, perhaps I will start uh, with a remark about the uh, institutional nature of the EU, uh, which I think explains a little bit why in the case of the EU, uh, it is even more complicated, much more complicated than in the US uh, when we ask how the EU approaches um, Central Asia and why there actually cannot be any coherent approach uh, in the EU towards Central Asia. And then I will talk a little bit about the um, evolution uh, of how the EU has been uh, viewing Central Asia over time and also its own role in Central Asia, because I think it's, uh, it will allow to contextualize the current uh, EU approach to the region. And also it will be a little bit of a background for um, Jean Beg and Fabian's interventions later. Uh, so I think at first, a uh, very important question to, to ask uh, when we speak about the, the EU in Central Asia is what is actually the EU or who is the EU? Uh, because unlike in the case of the US, where of course there are several actors, as we heard um, a second ago uh, about administration versus the Congress and so on. But in case of the EU, um, we are actually talking about the, an enormous multiplicity of actors who have very different understandings of Central Asia and also very different interests in Central Asia. And this is related to the 
uh, to, to the nature of the EU, which is not a state and which is not a classical international organization, but it is a system of uh, multilateral governance. Uh, so who are the main actors on the EU side? Uh, we are dealing with the European uh, External Action Service, which is kind of a foreign policy and defense ministry of, EU, of the EU. Uh, and this is the actor that generally has been advocating over years for more engagement uh, with Central Asia. But on the other hand, we have the European Parliament that has been over years more skeptical about strengthening uh, relations with countries in Central Asia because of uh, for human rights records. And I think a very good case here is the, uh, the EU delegation in Turkmenistan, which was opened only in uh, 2019. And this is exactly why so late. The question is why so late. So it is so late because they have been these different positions between the external action service and the parliament. And this is the outcome which also shows what is the nature of, of EU policymaking, that it is very time taking, uh, it is very bureaucratic, and it, it takes all of these uh, interests into account. Um, then there is also the European Commission, which is one of the executive bodies of the EU, and it has a very different set of interests because over the years it has been more engaged in extracting uh, hydrocarbons and mineral oils uh, from uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Turkmenistan. On the top of that, we also have transnational companies from EU member states that are not so much linked to, to member states, but in some cases are as any, the Italian oil and gas company, and they also major players uh, in the field, uh, in, in, for example, Kazakhstan. And on the top of that, we also have EU member states uh, who also view Central Asia very differently. So it is not a secret that the first uh, 2007 EU Central Asia strategy was adopted under the presidency of Germany in the Council of the EU, and it was largely, uh, it is attributed as Germany's baby <laughs> in that period of time, which wasn't anymore the case in 2019 uh, with the new strategy. So all of uh, the implications of this complex uh, structure of the EU is that there cannot be one coherent position, and also that, as I said, uh, EU policymaking is very bureaucratized, it's very time-taking, uh, because all of these actors need to agree among each other um, how to deal with Central Asia. Uh, when we look at the evolution of, um, of, of the views that the EU has, uh, has, held about, has held about Central Asia over time, uh, I think that we see a clear uh, differentiation, um, a, a clear evolution. Um, so let's start from, from 91 and independence of Central Asian countries. Of course, at that time, the EU was largely peripheral, uh, the, the Central Asia was largely peripheral to, to the EU. Uh, and I think um, the fact that uh, the EU has been engaging with Central Asia through its technical assistance program that was mainly targeted Russia also shows what was the initial tangent of the way how, uh, how the EU was, was viewing Central Asia as kind of an extension uh, of Russia and its new relations with, with independent Russia. Uh, later in the, in the 90s, uh, the perception becomes a bit more complicated because the EU uh, largely views Central Asia as potentially unstable and dangerous. It has to do with, with several small and big intra and interstate conflicts in Central Asia, border clashes, and also the Tajik uh, civil war. Uh, in 2001, there is a shift, uh, of course, attributed to 9-11 and the uh, subsequent war on terror and the US-led uh, military intervention in Central Asia, uh, uh, in Afghanistan, neighboring Central Asia. And of course, as a consequence on, of the war on terror, the region uh, gained more attention from the EU uh, and also other Western actors, of course, and became its ally. Uh, so as a consequence, at this period of time, uh, the EU becomes Sort of a buffer zone between unstable Afghanistan and other parts of other parts of Eurasia. And when we look at many of EU-funded projects at that time, we realize that there is a lot on border management and control, drug prevention, and so on. So you see that the ultimate aim of this engagement at that time was really to secure Europe from potential threats. Um, then we have 2007, so, so the first EU Central Asian strategy that was criticized. Uh, for many reasons. One of the reasons is that the EU has seen Central Asia as a region that doesn't actually have much in common. So there was very much a unified approach to Central Asia. As a result, uh, the strategy was too general and for this reason, not, not feasible. Uh, but what I think is also very important that the EU has uh, always seen Central Asia as a neighbor of the neighbor. So this means that, that Central Asia had a secondary imp importance uh, for the EU. And this is because the EU priority attention uh, was always on Eastern partnership countries, so Moldova, Ukraine, Armenia, um, and so on. 
Another uh, perception of the EU that remains constant of her years is that it sees Central Asia as a region, uh, which very mu much uh, reflects EU's own experience with region building. So the, the idea of EU, what the, what the EU means, um, and it reflects a general uh, fondness of the EU to also build regions in other parts of the world. But apart from seeing Central Asia as a region, the EU wants, also wanted to reshape the Central Asian region by linking it to Afghanistan. Um, so there's also lots of uh, kind of intervention and re redrawing of the borders of the region um, in this approach. Um, and then when we speak about the more uh, recent uh, current approach that is very much visible in the 2019 uh, EU strat strategy for Central Asia, we see a contradiction. And why is that? Because on the one hand, the EU has been stressing dialogue and it has been trying to um, create a sort of interaction with Central Asian countries that puts all parties uh, at the same diplomatic footing. Uh, as treat, uh, this means to, to listen to local voices and also treat Central Asian countries as equal. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the EU uh, has been increasingly seeing Central Asia through its own uh, antagonistic relations with Russia and China. And that was, of course, also before the Russia's war in Ukraine. So you see that there is an inconsistency because on the one hand, the EU wants to be a partner that listens to local actors and local needs. Uh, that cares about uh, promoting prosperity and resilience in Central Asia, that is interested in social fields uh, such as healthcare, education, that is interested in labor conditions and climate. Um, the EU that uh, once constantly repeats that it is the number one uh, provider of development assistance to the Central Asian region. But on the other hand, uh, there is this kind of uh, not direct rivalry uh, so if Russia and China advance norms of stability and non-interference in Central Asia, the EU places more, uh, more focus on liberal values such as human rights, freedom of, of expression, freedom of media, um, and so on. Uh, so perhaps finally, a few words, uh, how all of this is visible in the current condition, uh, one year uh, from, from the beginning of Russia's war in Ukraine. Uh, I think that uh, what we see now in terms of EU approach is not actually an, a shift. Uh, but it is really an amplification of all of these trends that I have just talked about. Um, so unlike Russia, the EU does not demand Central Asia to abandon relations with, with, uh, with its other partners. So this is also very similar uh, to, to the US approach. But on the other hand, uh, it is, I think, not an accident that recently we really see, uh, just like in the US case, so much more uh, attention of, of the EU given to Central Asia. We have all of these high-level visits to strengthen bilateral relations. Um, another, uh, another example, in December, the EU launched uh, quite steady negotiations of a new um, enhanced uh, partnership agreement with Tajikistan. Uh, so we see, and maybe this is also a reply to one of our questions um, posted in the chat, that the EU is not really thinking about secondary sanctions on Central Asia, but it's really is rather creating incentives that would uh, perhaps link Central Asian states uh, more closely to, to the EU to kind of create an, a, a sense of attractiveness. Um, so from the EU point of view, this is just to conclude, um, it is really about creating, increasing the autonomy of Central Asian states to lower their dependence on Russia. But perhaps this is not necessarily how it is seen by, by Central Asian policymakers. Uh, and I will stop here by saying that I think this historical, uh, this historical overview is really useful uh, to show why the EU approaches Central Asia in this way in the face of the war of Ukraine. And that is really not a shift, but rather an outcome of these accumulated perceptions uh, from the last three decades and these established ways uh, of interacting uh, with each other. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's uh, go to Dr. Arinov uh, and his assessment of the strengths yeah. and weaknesses of the EU policy. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here and kind of just kind of reflecting on the de recent developments of the Western actors, how they approach Central Asia and what is changing and what is not. So today I'll be talking about part, partly continuing what Karilina has been saying uh, about the EU's engagement with Central Asia. And I totally agree, agree with Karilina's point that 
again, the Central Asia is not the most important uh, region for the for, for the European Union, and then that has some kind of uh, implications for the use policy towards the region. And if you look kind of uh, back uh, to, into the 90s or the early 2000s, maybe kind of the re most recent uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, again, the use policy towards Central Asia has uh, mostly been um, kind of reactive to something which uh, ha has been kind of happening outside the region. Yeah. So again, uh, the, all this uh, tasks and other kind of programs back in the 90s kind of uh, mainly designed for Eastern European and later for Russia, and then just later automatically extended to Central Asia. And then in the 2000s, early 2000s, and Afghanistan, again, something happening outside this fight five central post-Soviet Central Asian countries, again, increasing uh, the region's profile in the eyes of um, the European Union. And the first strategy, again, of 2007 was also kind of a logical continuation of this. I mean, some people, again, I may argue that, again, that strategy and the strategy of 2019 kind of indicated the increase of the increase of Central Asia's importance for the EU, but uh, I don't think so. I think uh, those are just kind of the natural developments of the EU's restructuring of its foreign policy towards uh, post-Soviet countries or its global policy uh, in general in 2010s, for instance. And then, then those uh, strategies for Central Asia were just part of this bigger picture rather than uh, some kind of indicators of uh, the increase of Central Asia's uh, importance for the, uh, for the EU. So, the point, the first point that I would like to make is that again, Central Asia is not the, uh, and then, uh, sorry, kind of to kind of one point, 2020, uh, the war, I mean, uh, just a year ago, again, uh, some people are kind of arguing again about the return of Central Asia to the EU's, into the EU's kind of uh, agenda again. So something happening outside the region and that's making the EU to pay some attention uh, to Central Asia. Uh, so again, the point, the first point is that Central Asia is not the most important um, region for the EU. And when we criticize the EU for invisibility, for ineffectiveness, and for all the other kind of uh, things in Central Asia, I think uh, that kind of criticism first, uh, not first, but for, the, for some part comes from these higher expectations from the EU in Central Asia, right? So again, we expect the EU to be you know, sometimes, uh, some commentators again, expect the EU to be um, maybe kind of uh, equally active like Russia, like China, or like like Turkey I mean, uh, and then other countries and kind of increasing its visibility. But the reality is that again, uh, it's a kind of very peripheral region for the EU. Uh, and, uh, but again, this war, the recent war, Russia's invasion of Ukraine um, has changed something in the EU's approach. And again, we have all this kind of visits, all have these kind of uh, discussions about how uh, the EU could uh, restructure, how the EU could uh, intensify its relations with Central Asia. And it's not just about kind of uh, the EU altruistically wanting to, I don't know, to, to, to help Central Asian countries uh, to, to uh, survive in this very difficult geopolitical, social, economic conditions, but also kind of the EU is also has its own interests. First of all, this comes from the from the energy sources, right? Again, um, and then and the tra transportation um, corridors uh, through Central Asia um, to the EU, uh, and all these kind of discussions are still there. But the the thing is again. Uh, for, for instance, we've been discussing in EU Central Asia kind of relations, we've been discussing for the increase, increasingly discussing this, uh, the, the issue of middle corridor, for instance, right, how uh, we can, uh, the EU can um, participate in this, in, in diversifying this uh, transport routes uh, through Central Asia to the EU. But again, the discussion, this discussion is not just kind of a new one. This has been there. Uh, since early 90s, when the EU started engaging with the region, and the issue is still there. It's a very, very complex issue. There are so many issues, but um, again, uh, maybe something is going to change after this. So, for instance, last year, the EU, the European Commission, uh, is sponsoring a study by the EBRD uh, of the sustainability of this uh, different corridors uh, to diversify um, the trade routes uh, through Central Asia to 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 the EU and that the results will be, I think, published somewhere this year in a couple of months, I guess. And then based on that, the EU may kind of decide to, to take some actions to participate. Turkey is actively also doing the same kind of stuff, just trying to link uh, to this middle corridor, to, to the European kind of corridor. So yeah, the, still, uh, the issue is still there. There are lots of issues about this middle corridor. Um, 
uh, the issues related to infrastructure, which requires tons of amounts of um, investments, the issue of uh, the customs regulations, for instance, the issue of the standards and so on and so forth. But again, possibly we're going to see some kind of change in that uh, sense. The second issue is about this energy diversification currently uh, very much present in the EU's agenda towards Central Asia. Uh, for instance, a month ago, or two months ago, uh, Kazakhstan um, announced that it's going to ship uh, the, the, the first oil directly uh, uh, Kazakh oil directly to Germany, but again, uh, it was announced that by, and by the end of January, they're going to send first oil, but again, it's now March, mid-March, and uh, it hasn't been sent uh, due to some kind of bureaucratic, officially, some bureaucratic kind of uh, issues on the part of the EU. So uh, that issue, and then Kazakhstan signed uh, this memorandum of understanding with the EU in November last year about this uh, rare earth materials, which is also extremely important for the EU when it comes to um, sustainable uh, energy development uh, and all these issues are still there. So again, given all this kind of EU's engagement in the region, yes, the EU has interest. The EU um, is uh, important for Central Asian countries in many senses, especially for Kazakhstan. I mean, if you look at this trade and investment uh, uh, kind of numbers uh, for Kazakhstan and, the, and the, the EU also kind of is interested in Kazakhstan. But again, we have to be realistic about what the EU can and cannot uh, do in Central Asia. And, um, so that kind of realistic assessment would give some kind of ideas what the EU could do better. So um, if we compare the EU to, okay, I have a couple of minutes, I guess, left. Uh, if we compare the EU to other actors in Central Asia, for instance, to, to Russia, to China, even to the US, I think the, 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 the most obvious uh, kind of aspect where the EU could do more uh, uh, would be, I think, this, this, this human uh, dimension. Because again, if you look at the... Uh, different kind of surveys, polls in Central Asian countries. Uh, the EU is the actor that enjoys a very much positive image uh, in the region, right? Again, um, we can't, I mean, uh, the, the US, for instance, perceptions in the region, I wouldn't say that they are kind of uh, vastly positive. Yeah. So, for, for the, again, there are so many uh, different studies on that. And the issue of xenophobia, for instance, in the region, again, well studied, well documented, especially in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. So now Russia, with the Russia's invasion of Ukraine, I think um, we are, as a society, at least in Kazakhstan, maybe partly in, Kyr in Kyrgyzstan, maybe in other countries as well, we are kind of, I think, seeing this uh, transformation of the attitudes towards Russia. I'm not saying that it's kind of, kind of a, a na nationwide process in Kazakhstan, everyone just kind of rethinking what Russia is and how we uh, need to how we need to deal with Russia, but at least the process is there. And the many of people, many, many people in Kazakhstan, at least in bigger cities, um, kind of um, changing their attitudes, uh, being kind of more skeptical about Russia and its behavior. So in that sense, uh, again, the EU remains uh, or is likely to become the most positively perceived, one of the most most positively perceived uh, actors in the region uh, who will be welcome, very much welcome uh, in the region. I think that's the most important, uh, I think, uh, the comparative advantage of the EU in the region. So all Central Asian countries are very much uh, young societies, right? For instance, in Kazakhstan, the median age, I think, is something around 20, uh, 32, sorry. In Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, it's even lower, something around uh, 28, 29, right? So in that sense, I think the EU's approach um, should be more focused on this um, kind of further um, well, strengthening its this the, the, this positive image, the kind of the people's positive attitudes towards regions. One way could be this more engagement with the uh, with youth, uh, given the EU's limited budget of financial resources and other kind of limitations, uh, I think that won't be that much uh, kind of difficult to do. So one free example would be opening a kind of university, European university in Central Asia, which has been offered, I don't know, 10 years ago, and Kyrgyz, uh, Kyrgyz minister um, offering that again, uh, suggesting that again a couple of years ago, but uh, again, this, uh, the issue is still there. So the EU will never become... Uh, the most visible geopolitical uh, actor in Central Asia, but that I think, uh, given these limitations, that kind of human engagement, the people-to-people -people engagement kind of approach of the EU uh, would be uh, something that the EU could do much better than it's currently doing. So I'll just stop here, and if there are any questions, I'll be happy to address them later. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Well, actually, I would trace this discussion on establishing uh, a European university or College of Europe or something like that even further. I remember these discussions in 2000, around 2007, when the, when the new strategy was adopted. And uh, I was part of these discussions as well. And I, I really, uh, I think that would be really great that that would, you know, upgrade the relationship uh, substantially. Uh, and maybe one little note. Um, I wouldn't blame the European uh, bureaucracy actually for for um, uh, for this kind of lack of uh, export of Kazakh crude to 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 Europe um, via Druzhba. Yesterday there was a Bloomberg report saying that Kazakhstan doesn't have enough capacity actually to um, to send this crude to yeah Germany. Germany. Okay, uh, so well. I I think what uh, what Jenny Beck said it would be really a good uh, you know good point uh, to continue with uh, with uh, what Dr. Basu has to say. Maybe maybe not. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so um, yeah. Uh, thank you, Marquis, also for uh, introducing me, um, and uh, many thanks also to the Institute for War and Peace Reporting for inviting me to contribute to this expert panel. Um, so what I will do in my talk is I will assess the EU's democracy promotion and civil society support policies for Central Asia. Um, in doing this, I will offer a rather critical perspective, which draws on some recent research I have been conducting. Now, when it comes to EU democracy promotion and civil society support in Central Asia, I think it's fair to say that the EU has an ambiguous track record. Now, ever since it started increasing its engagement with Central Asia in the mid 2000s, it has put democracy promotion on its agenda for Central Asia. And if we look at the current EU strategy for Central Asia, the one that was launched in 2019, then promoting democracy and supporting civil society are mentioned as part of the key priority of boosting the resilience of the Central Asian countries, both states and, and uh, societies. So at least on paper, still democracy promotion and civil society support, their prominent goals for the EU in Central Asia. The question is then, okay, but how effective has the EU's democracy promotion and civil society support policies been so far? I think in fairness, hardly any scholar will argue that the EU's democracy promotion in the region has so far been effective. Um, yeah, first of all, the scope of the EU's democracy promotion activities in Central Asia has been fairly limited. Um, it's true that in Kyrgyzstan and in Kazakhstan, the EU has been more active in promoting the democracy than in the other countries. But even in Kyrgyzstan and in Kazakhstan, the EU's democracy promotion agenda has been limited, especially if you would compare this to what the EU has been doing in the Eastern Partnership countries. Um, and this, of course, relates to what both Carolina and, and Janibek already highlighted, namely that Central Asia is simply not a priority region for the EU. So it's it's still this sort of peripheral region uh, for the EU or this neighbor of, of our neighbors. Um, then um, the democracy promotion activities that the EU has undertaken in Central Asia arguably failed to have much impact. Uh, the same, I think, also applies to the EU civil society support in Central Asia. Now, if we look at um, the explanations for this limited impact of the EU's democracy promotion and civil society uh, support in Central Asia, beyond the fact that, okay, well, the EU has limited budget to do this, um, there's also this limited interest in doing it in Central Asia, um, but there are still some, some other factors that, that uh, are interesting to be highlighted. Um, yeah, first of all, the EU basically only has limited incentives to offer to the Central Asian countries, especially if you compare it to um, the Eastern Partnership countries uh, like Ukraine and, and Georgia um, and Moldova. Um, there, these con countries basically really have yeah, an interest in integrating with the EU. So uh, this also means that the EU can offer much more to these countries. This is not the case for Central Asia. Um, also, arguably, the, the way in which the EU um, has been promoting civil society and has been um, yeah, engaging with, with civil society, also that is somewhat yeah, deficient. Um, there 
and this relates also to some extent to the whole bureaucratic machinery behind um, EU um, development aid. Um, and then there's also the point that yeah, the EU is reluctant to use conditionalities in Central Asia due to the yeah the EU's prioritization of interests over values in Central Asia. Um, now, when it comes to this latter point, it's clear that the EU prioritizes stability over democracy in Central Asia. For the EU's short-term interests, it's important that Central Asia remains stable. Uh, we can clearly observe how the EU is currently still maintaining good relations with most of the Central Asian states, despite the authorities of the Central Asian states remaining highly authoritarian, or in some cases, like Kyrgyzstan, becoming more authoritarian uh, compared to 10, 10 years ago. But then, and this brings me to the more critical uh, perspective I want to offer here, um, some scholars, um, yeah, they, they want to take this discussion to a different level. And they have argued that, um, in essence, the EU's approach to democracy promotion and to civil society support in Central Asia, it's still very recentric. Um, and also, um, they blame the neoliberal uh, nature of the EU's approach to values promotion uh, and to civil society support. And they say that, well, this also hinders the effectiveness of the EU's democracy promotion and civil society support. Um, so in its democracy promotion and, and in its engagement with civil society, the EU does indeed continue to have this sort of neoliberal and also clearly Eurocentric vexation on sharing norms through sort of ready-made solutions. Um, and this can clearly be observed also in how the EU promotes democracy and how it engages with local civil society actors in Central Asia, and also in how the EU envisions the role of civil society in the Central Asian countries. So just like in other regions, the EU's approach to civil society support and democracy promotion in, in Central Asia, um, it proceeds in a very technocratic, almost managerial manner. Um, and it's really aimed at transferring externally molded ready-made solutions to the local context of the Central Asian uh, societies. Now, when it comes to the substance of these ready-made solutions that the EU is transferring, now well, the substance um, of the democracy promotion and the civil society support, it's embedded in the neoliberal paradigm of the state civil society market triangle. Uh, and also in, in the Western ideological concept of liberal democracy. So this is very much the case and has been so for almost two decades now. Um, and so it's also not surprising to see that in engaging with local civil society actors, the EU still shows this continued reliance on Western style organizations, because these have the professional systems and, and, and processes that are needed for accessing and managing EU funding. Uh, plus these also better fit the use Western understanding of civil society. So what I would argue here, based on also what other uh, scholars have been arguing recently, is that if the EU would want its approach to democracy promotion and civil society to be more effective in Central Asia, the EU will need to acknowledge that its initiatives to promote democracy and to support civil society, yeah, they cannot simply be molded externally um, and instead, they really have to start internally from the local context, from local communities. And they should reflect a better understanding of, of local value systems in Central Asia and also the local conceptions and local practices of democracy and civil society. Um, now, if we look at prevalent value systems in Central Asia, then we can see, for instance, the centrality of social trust, of solidarity. Um, and these um, are norms that are strongly reflected in local forms and local practices of self-reliance and self-governance. And Western donors, including the EU, yeah, they still ignore these institutions and traditions and practices because, yeah, they simply they, they do not fit the Western-centric definitions of governance, uh, democracy, and civil society. So if we take the example of Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan, for instance, at the community level, we see central role uh, for the Aksakals. Um, I don't have to explain what the Aksakals are here, um, but there's also, for instance, at the community level, there's a traditional practice of the um, Ashkar or Fashkar, uh, in which people from the community are expected to provide assistance for community members as part of sort of joint effort to, to improve the living standards within the community. 
But then also, if, if we look at a concrete case of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, well, there we've also seen how civil society and community-based initiatives across Central Asia were instrumental in addressing the direct impacts of the pandemic, especially in those fields where governments fell short, uh, such as medical supports, provision of information, uh, provision of social protection. And so there we saw that local civil society and community-based initiatives, including self-help groups in Central Asia, have played a really crucial role in offering life-saving assistance, uh, including to the, the more vulnerable groups in society. So the pandemic has really revealed the existing challenges in Central Asia relating to poor state governance and weak state capacity. So this should be also a clear signal for the EU. Uh, and at the same time, the pandemic also endorsed the key role that the grassroots civil society and, and community-based practices of self-reliance have played in strengthening the society's resilience uh, in the face of such a major crisis. So therefore, my argument here is really that the EU's approach to democracy promotion and civil society in Central Asia, if, if, it, well, if at least the EU is sincere about this and if it want, wants its uh, approach to be more effective, well, it has to be then more attuned to the local realities. And that means that you will have to start uh, more from, from yeah, in-depth knowledge about the local value systems um, and, and also the local perceptions about yeah, the potential of local forms of self-governance that reflect local value systems. And so um, to conclude, um, of course, yeah, I don't want to um, overemphasize this. And, and of course, we all know also that um, in Central Asia, the local community systems and practices of self-governance and self-reliance are not without their flaws and pitfalls. And so, for instance, when it comes to trust networks um, that we see, especially in the rural areas in Central Asia, yeah, we know that these are determined by patrimonial and part, uh, patriarchal values. And so they are not void of opportunistic behavior uh, on behalf of the so-called patron. And so that means that they're not necessarily a panacea for promoting uh, emancipation and for uh, overcoming social injustice. Um, so my point here is that, of course, the EU should not be uncritical about local value systems and local self-governance forms, but still the EU should, should seek to, to support these um, self-governance forms and practices more uh, based on a deep understanding of how these function within the societal fabric of the countries concerned um, and also of how these can be further improved. Um, and on this note, um, I will end my talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fabienne. Um, a lot of food for thought. I think we can dedicate a whole session to <laughs> discussing uh, to discussing the issues you raised um, and your recommendations. But let's open the floor for questions. We have about 16 minutes. Um, so let me uh, go straight to uh, Sergei Marinin's questions. Um, and actually, it is about democracy promotion and it is about uh, human rights, support for human rights uh, in Central Asia. And, um, and he's asking about the... Uh, um, okay, so, so given the, this interest, uh, interest in, in Central Asia, what's going to happen to foster human rights and democracy in Central Asia? And also given the increased democratic backsliding in uh, some of the... Uh, regions, countries, uh, and we all, of course, think about Kyrgyzstan. Um, who wants to uh, to take this question? Maybe Fabian, since you were talking about democracy promotion, maybe you can we can go to you first and then to uh, uh, to Bria. Yeah, well, I can focus mainly on the EU, but it was interesting. I think the ambassador already mentioned that actually when it comes to the US, there's a decreased interest in promoting democracy. And um, But in the case of the EU, um, well, there's definitely not, um, I think there's not much of a change um, in the latest strategy. So the 2019 strategy for Central Asia, democracy promotion really still features quite prominently, but it, yeah, it's just on paper. Um, so if you look at the practice, we see that democracy promotion is not a priority for the EU, believe me. Um, but yeah, and the reasons that I already um, highlighted, uh, they're really still still very much valid, even if we see that um, 
in the case of Kyrgyzstan, which was yeah, this island of democracy uh, in the region, um, which yeah, the EU always really preferred cooperating with. Um, there, actually, I would say that the EU is not going to insist more um, than before on, on promoting democracy. So especially in, in cases where we see actually um, democratic backsliding, um, such as in the case of Kyrgyzstan, um, the EU will probably feel that they have left leverage um, than they had before, and that uh, rather than increasing its efforts, it might actually also decrease them. Uh, whereas in a case like, um, well, Kazakhstan, that's <laughs> not sure whether it's the best case here, the EU would actually be more inclined to increase its efforts to, them, to, to promote democracy. Um, so it's really on a case by by case basis that the EU feels like, OK, if they see that country is ready to go ahead with further political reforms, then they want to be ready to support that country in those efforts, which means that in the case of Kyrgyzstan, the EU will actually decrease its efforts. Um, in Kazakhstan, it might increase its efforts. Yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, Brian, can we go to you? Sure. I, I would just say we should be very careful about equating like public statements about human rights to actual action being taken by the United States. I know that there's a lot of conversations going on, but they're being done very quietly behind the scenes because historically we have not had a very good uh, reception when we've tried to publicly chastise our partners over human rights issues. I think that there's a time and a place for that conversation and it, it is occurring and it's occurring at all levels. I mentioned the US Congress. What I didn't say is we've actually had several congressional delegations that have also visited Central Asia over the last year. So certainly there's congressional interest. They're raising these issues as well. And not just in regards to Kazakhstan and the events that happened in January of 2022. There's also been questions related to Uzbekistan and the events that occurred in Nukus as well as in Tajikistan and the events in Gabao. So certainly human rights issues are front and center in the US government. Um, they are being discussed by a number of actors, but it's all being done very quietly, I think. Over. Yes, Ambassador Crow. Oh, you're yeah, muted. Okay. Yeah. Um... Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I would agree it, it's not uh, dead in the United States, but I, I think, uh, Dr. Basut, you make very a, a great many very good points because I've been, you know, as an ambassador in Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and, and in Belarus, too. Uh, all of these efforts of democracy promotion, which are, you know, promoted by, uh, in the United States Congress, uh, an interest in it up to, up to a point but also all the, I would call almost the industry of democracy promotion institutes and the like that are involved in this, you know, globally supported a, a lot by the United States and the EU, is they, they kind of miss the point which you are making, which is uh, focusing on and understanding the local conditions and local traditions that we have. Because I'd say that uh, my own uh, observation has been you know, pretty, I would say, disastrous results of democracy promotion efforts uh, by the United States government. And while I, I know there's a lot of discussion about this, in, you know, in among the policy makers, but they don't seem to reflect too much on how, how receptive societies are to the kind of, you know, the external projection of the values and the like. And if you take Look at Afghanistan, look at Kyrgyzstan. You know, I remember there was the doubling down on Kyrgyzstan after the 2010 events there and look where it is now. I mean, also like the American University in, in Bishkek is, it's been under a lot of pressure that its president was basically forced out and things of this nature too. And, and there's a lot behind this. And then also the, the, the it, what you look at Tunisia and what's happening there and this backsliding you know, certainly shown, I think, a certain, the, 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 you know, the, the, uh, whether you want to call it a failure, but it's also, it's, uh, it, it's a far more complicated issue than the way it's looked at, I think, from, you know, from those in Washington and, uh, and perhaps in, in Brussels as well. Um, I, I think there needs to be a thorough reflection on this which I don't really see happening uh, in the United States. It's almost the, let's do more, let's put more money into it or whatever. 
Um, but there's no no real, I don't really get a sense of basically going back to your assumptions and things of this nature, but I think that's that's what's required on a lot of a lot of issues in Central Asia. I think one thing I would just mention too is we're not talking about the growth of nationalism or national in Central Asian countries. You know, this is 30 years of independence and how that is developing. It's been a lot of top-down from the governments themselves to create a, you know, a nation out of the people. Um, but this is this is this is a phenomenon that I think it requires perhaps more study and understanding of how these peoples and these entities, including their governments, don't want to be dominated. And you this gets into your decolonialization discussion too, don't want to be dominated by anyone, not Turks, not Russians, not Chinese, and not by quote unquote Western, um, uh, you know, I if you will culture. Um, and this has to be carefully understood, and I don't have an answer to it, but I think uh, it, it, it needs to be uh, studied. Thank you very much. Um, well, it was mentioned several times that uh, um, that stability and security of Central Asia is among the, the key interests, both of the EU and, uh, uh, and US in the region. Um, and we got a question about uh, Fergana Valley. Uh, we we know that uh, there were border clashes uh, last year on the Kyrgyz Tajik border and uh, the, the the year before that as well. So, do we see any changing uh, changing approaches of the uh, in the uh, U.S. and you know among U.S. and EU policymakers to the kind of <laughs> Stability, so, so in the support for stability and security in the region and conflict prevention. If panelists have any thoughts on that, maybe in the light. Can I really say something on this yes. uh, directly? So I think this also links to one of the previous questions, which was about the global gateway uh, in Central Asia. So maybe for those who are not uh, familiar with uh, nuances of this project, this is the global uh, strategy of the EU to foster infrastructure around the world. So in a way, this is an EU version of uh, one, uh, one Belt, One Road initiative um, of China uh, with, a, with an EU take because the EU talks mostly about uh, energy, meaning green transitions and about connectivity as digital connectivity. So this is a little bit different from physical infrastructure. Um, so within a global gateway, which, which as I said, is a global strategy, there is, uh, of course, a, an approach to specific regions of the world as well. Um, in uh, November, I think it was in November 2022, there was an uh, opening conference in Samarkand where the EU launched its regional vision of global gateway for Central Asia. So there wasn't specifically a, a focus on the Fergana Valley, but there was a, a mention of uh, areas on which the EU will, will focus in Central Asia. So that was a uh, water supply system. I think that was also sanitation waste management and something related to hydropower. So this is, as I said, not directly related to Fergana Valley, but perhaps this will be one of the regions where this is uh, going to be implemented. Um, but having said that, uh, I think it will it will take time uh, for us to see actually how these projects look like and what are the outcomes, because I do not think it has even started. OK, um, great. Any other takes on the? On the issue, maybe on the American side, yes, that's the call. Well, with regard to the Fergana Valley uh, and and also the relationship between uh, um, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, you know, it's clear that you don't have uh, a, either a system or a mechanism for resolving, except bilaterally, between these countries. And we've seen that Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan have managed to get. Uh, have a, a resolution of their water uh, sharing uh, situation, but there was a reaction in Kyrgyzstan uh, against that, uh, which was um, you know put down, as well as the issues between Kyrgyzstan and and um, uh, and, and uh, Tajikistan. And since you don't have a dominant power there, as it was when they were all part of the Soviet Union, and it was Moscow that did it, or any or anyone. You're, you're seeing the results, I think, of this, the, the breakup, uh, and also of how they can resolve their issues uh, regionally. And there isn't really a strong regional uh, mechanism 
uh, among just the countries themselves for dissolving it because they have the suspicions of one another of not wanting to be dominated by anyone, not by Uzbekistan or by uh, Kazakhstan as kind of the big, uh, the big uh, powers in, in Central Asia. So I think it's very difficult uh, to conceive of ways to, to, to deal with these you know, although the EU has examples uh, that it can it can put forward and the like, and the UN, we haven't mentioned that it it's present there, uh, but you know it's not particularly uh, active. I mean, they have that center in in Turkmenistan um, that is supposed to be preventative diplomacy, but you know, can that what is happening with that issue here? But uh, I think this is all part and parcel of what we've seen as the the demise of the regional uh, conception that even the, the countries themselves and their leaderships have. It's, it's absent. Thank you very much. Uh, well, we are unfortunately running out of time. So two quick questions, one on secondary sanctions. Um, are Central Asians in uh, kind of danger of falling under secondary secondary sanctions? Uh, and are we doing enough not to fall under secondary sanctions? And the second question is on cooperation in the area of biosafety. Uh, we know that uh, the, web, the well, at least Kazakhstan had the biosafety uh, lab that was uh, sponsored by uh, by American partners, and there was a lot of pressure. Uh, from from Moscow on Kazakhstan on Astana to close uh, to 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 stop this cooperation, um, and a lot of disinformation, uh, the kind of floating around and pushed uh, also well uh, pushed around. Uh, so, uh, what are the prospects of uh, of this cooperation? You think? Um, uh, can I reflect on the, on the first, yes, first yes. question? If that's past one sanctions again, I'm not. The, an economist by training and I don't claim any kind of thing but uh, from the kind of conversations uh, with the uh, decision makers or some kind of uh, bureaucrats at the EU level it seems to be that uh, the EU at least gives a kind of has a kind of clear idea about um, the the sanctions secondary sanctions against Central Asian countries the, the point uh, the the dominant point there is that uh, they seem to understand the difficulty of controlling all those uh, pearl export uh, kind of things. Uh, and then um, to me, it seems that uh, if governments won't be directly, Central Asian governments won't be directly involved in um, this kind of uh, bypassing the, 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 the sanctions, uh, we won't see any kind of um, um, secondary sanctions from the EU side because this, all this again, we saw the numbers, uh, the increase from Kazakh, the export in, exports increase from Kazakhstan to Russia, from Kyrgyzstan to Russia, from Armenia to Russia, kind of doubled, tripled uh, over the course of the last year. But uh, at least the, on the EU side, there seems to be kind of uh, consensus opinion that well, it's not the governments doing it, kind of being directly involved in this kind of things. Just it's rather the the, the private uh, companies private retailers. And in that sense, I don't think that the EU would be kind of punishing the Central Asian countries based on that. Um, so that, that's my kind of general, very subjective, limited understanding of the EU's perspective on this. But, but sanctions are imposed on companies, right? Uh, maybe for the US perspective, but like 15 yeah. seconds, 10 seconds, Brian, yes. Yeah, if I could just elaborate a little bit further on what Janabek said. So I, I think we need to differentiate between actual government involvement in any uh, activity that would be sanctioned, and then knowing about sanctions evasion. So for instance, all of the private companies that could potentially be operating from Central Asia, but doing business with Russia. I think perhaps the bigger concern would be that the longer that the conflict goes on, in order to discourage that kind of activity, what kind of pressure could be put in place so that you know, companies are not allowed to operate from Central Asia and further assist in kind of the, the war effort um, and continue funding it to an extent. So I think that's probably the bigger concern. As, as Jean Beck pointed out, I don't think anyone's accusing any of the governments in Central Asia of being party to anything that would be sanctionable activities. But certainly if they have knowledge that it's occurring on their territory, that would be problematic. And maybe Ambassador Kroll uh, is the, the biosafety 
partnership, a sort of a, a victim <laughs> of the, well, the I, dramatic geopolitical developments. Yeah, I, I, I guess I'm trying to understand what biosafety is because you know this the the, the you know this um, laboratory that the United States helped to fund was basically to protect. Uh, biological uh, uh, specimens and or, uh, uh, that that were in various institutes in 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 uh, Kazakhstan that had been that could potentially be used for uh, biological weaponry, and this was an idea to protect it, which is why it was under the defense threat, um, you know, uh, uh, elimination uh, uh, DITRA, as, it, as it's called, uh, um, organization in the United States, but. Uh, I think more importantly is the effects of what's been happening in the Aral Sea uh, and what had been done in Bosnia-Herzegovina Island, which is now part of the mainland, is a, I think a serious issue that needs to be studied. And and it would be beneficial, I think. I think Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, who share that uh, territory of it, are, are working with each other, or at least had been when I was in the area. And I think it is an area that uh, could be a great uh, a, a collaboration uh, with countries, uh, including the United States and, frankly, you know, Russia as well. Uh, and uh, in order to deal with that whole situation, which is a microcosm, as well as you know the whole issue over the drying up and the, you know the glaciers and things of this nature. So uh, it, there is that there is that opportunity, I think, that ought to be pursued. Um, by by the countries in the region, but also by uh, the major um, powers outside of it. Oh, well, definitely, but there is a lot of uh, pressure from from Moscow, kind of not to pursue, um, not to pursue this uh, cooperation. Um, I agree. Yeah. And yes, and uh, I guess um, our governments need to make very difficult choices. What sort of to what to pursue, what not to pursue. Um, okay, we are a little bit over time, uh, but um, but I hope you've enjoyed the uh, discussion and uh, learned a lot. I've learned a lot from the uh, from from the speakers. Uh, let me um, let me remind you about the uh, the feedback form. Um, I think you can find it in the chat, and uh, please please feel it and. Um, and also, let me thank uh, the, the the panelists. Let me thank the the audiences, the people who tuned, all of you who tuned in today, and uh, well, and thank the organizers for uh, organizing this event. Thank you very much, and have a nice weekend. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.